that is the picture from 2007, so I have changed a little bit, a little grayer since then. But um, I know many of you think my full-time job is fundraising. Uh, thank you so much for those of you who participated in this year's Bio Summit. I'm pleased to say we are going to make our, our goals. I'm very excited. Thank you so much to all the sponsors. And, uh, um, but my day job is uh, as a recruiter in the life sciences business. Uh, and I had the great pleasure 15 years ago of driving through a rainy Boston to meet a very premier cardiologist at Harvard. Uh, uh, Steve Osterley did not know that when I came to see him, I wasn't just soliciting his advice about who should be the top technology strategist for Medtronic, but I was actually seeing if he himself would consider changing career paths, whether he would step out of his top position at Harvard where he was critical in developing a lot of uh, the areas around balloon angioplasty and, and cardiova cardiovascular imaging and a lot of convergence of technologies and step into the world of the commercial side of medicine. And, and my pitch, which I was delighted that he accepted that challenge, was that what better way to make an impact upon medicine than working in one of the world's largest and most innovative companies, Medtronic. So it's uh, very interesting, however, a second sideline was is that we discovered later as our 15 years of friendship has progressed that our wives were actually in the same play group in Palo Alto when we both lived in California. So our wives and children knew each other. But anyway, so Steve joined the company uh, 14 years ago as the Senior Vice President for Medicine and Technology. He reminds me he is the most longest tenured member of the Executive Committee still at Medtronic. Uh, he provides executive leadership for their scientific research, formation of new technology strategies, and for the development of strong collaborative research with the world's medical communities. He says Medtronic has invested in 70 small companies. So those of you who are doing small companies, they're very interested in innovation. And Steve is the front door to a lot of the new technologies that are coming. Uh, he he's a 1973 summa cum laude graduate of Harvard and received his medical degree from Yale University in 1997. He's completed his internship and residency at Massachusetts General, and he has also served, got his fellowship in interventional cardiology at Stanford. It is with great pleasure to introduce you to my friend and futurist in, in all things technology, Steve Osterley. Tom, thanks very much. Uh, thank you for recruiting me to Medtronic. It's been one of the most vitally interesting periods of my life. It's just fantastic, so thank you. Thanks, Russell, for inviting me up here. I'm really happy to see all the students here. Um, you have a really fertile environment here in the greater Atlanta metro. You've got Emory, Georgia Tech, I think one of the best technical universities in the world, Morehouse Medical College, University of Georgia Regents. I mean, this is the basis of all invention and discovery comes out of these universities, and so if not here, where should you be developing devices and new molecular entities, biologic solutions? And I think you have the whole thing here. It's just waiting to explode. You need some more venture capital in town, Bob, so Tom, so maybe you can work on that. Um, I thought it might be interesting for, I have sensed that this is more pharma, bio, weighted than med device here. I may be wrong, but I thought it would be interesting to try to show you that the intersection is fairly blurred. And a lot of pharmaceutical companies are now working on electrical solutions to problems. We have a tremendous amount of stuff we do in drug delivery with devices. I'm gonna to focus today in this short period of time on some interesting evolution and convergence of electronic technology, information technology, software technology, communication technology, all of which was developed for consumer grade application. And I'm gonna to try to show you how the, these things actually can be integrated into medical devices and, and restore health and extend life for many, many people. Maybe challenge you to think about what you're doing and how you might work in this field of, of the electronic interface with medicine. I'm gonna say 30 seconds about Medtronic. I, I'm gonna assume that most of you know this is a very large medical device company. It's a global company founded 65 years ago in St. Paul around the repair of medical electronic equipment. Most of you probably don't know that modern cardiac surgery originated at the University of Minnesota with Walt Lillehei, who began exploring extracorporeal circulation. And that's really where modern biomedical engineering occurred. And at the time that Lillehei was repairing congenital heart defects, he was causing complete heart block in children. And so he required a temporary pacemaker. And this is Lillehei in the bottom of the slide. And he 
essentially had to go to Earl Bakken, who's up in the top of the slide, still alive, working in a little shed in St. Paul and say, look, I need a temporary pacemaker. And that's how the company got started. So the first pacemakers in the world were made. Earl pirated a circuit diagram from Popular Electronics 1956 for a battery-operated transistorized metronome. And as you might imagine, pacing and a metronome have a lot in common. And so that is the origins of the company. If you fast forward 65 years, we now have more than 50,000 people working in 120 countries, about 17 billion in revenue with about 5 billion of free cash flow. It's a highly successful company, still grows. And um, we're largely globalized at this point. We probably over half our sales are outside the United States. Uh, we've moved from pacemakers. This is just a sample of the products we market lead essentially in everything we do from diabetes to coronary interventions, cardiac rhythm management, neuromodulation, spine, imaging. Uh, we have a few other products. Tom's right, I left the Mass General to come to Medtronic and it never occurred to me that I would work in a company. I thought my mission was pretty simple. I was trying to help as many patients as I could and Tom and Art Collins, who was the CEO at the time, convinced me that the impact I could have from Medtronic would be bigger than I could have at the Harvard Medical School and it was true. We treated 10 million people last year with our devices. Not everybody got better, but we'd like to think most of them did. And so this is an interesting opportunity because I try to influence how we spend money, both internally and externally on innovation. And it's a nice chance as a physician to try to impact a lot of lives. So what I thought would be interesting is to sort of again, highlight a couple areas of technology integration. At the bottom of the slide are some interesting areas that are being integrated into devices. I'm not gonna address this today. But there's a lot going on in new materials, uh, MEMS technology, a lot of which occurs here in Atlanta, by the way. And I'm going to leave it alone. A lot of interesting things about biotechnology. I'll just say in one word that biologics cannot be realized without devices. You can't swallow biologics. If you do, you digest them. So they all require alternative delivery forms of some kind. And so devices will continue to play a huge role here. But I want to talk about sort of these areas of, again, what I view as consumer kind of app applied electronics, information systems, software, and show you how this plays out in medicine. And the first thing I'm gonna talk about is sort of how we've worked with sort of high density, low power microelectronics to progressively reduce the size of many of our implanted electronic devices. This is not different than what's inside your iPhone. And so much of the electronics that we use actually is pretty cheap because we can take it actually out of the consumer industry. We have quality issues that aren't the same as Apple. Uh, if your iPhone breaks, you know, you get another one. But we can't really have that kind of an attitude when we're implanting electronics. So there are some differences, but a lot of the implanted electronics we use are very similar to what you find in, in consumer grade electronics. I think most of you know that pacing uh, today is you went from temporary pacing to implanted pacemakers. We lead the world. We have about 50% market share in implanted pacemakers. And I think probably most of you know it's an implanted pulse generator. It goes under the skin in a surgical pocket. Leads are brought down into the inside of the heart. And this is standard pacing today. Um, if you, the very first pacemaker that was ever made, uh, I have with me, this didn't go through security very well yesterday, but it's here today. Uh, they were concerned about this. There's capacitors in here. It looked odd to them. They looked like shotgun shells, and they weren't happy with it. But this is the first pacemaker. It's basically a, shoe, a Kiwi shoe can that had capacitors, batteries inside of it, and it was used uh, for about a year or two, and the batteries would wear out. This is not a lead. This is the antenna, so it can be communicated with. And if you look at the evolution of pacemakers over the last 50 years on this slide, you can see I'm holding this one. None of these are, had the leads on them. They're all minus the leads. It's just the generators. And if you look very closely, on the right side of this slide, you will see our next generation pacemaker, which is already in clinical use in Europe. This is the whole thing. Um, I doubt that anyone can see this, but this is it. It's, a, it's about the size of an antibiotic capsule, and it's implanted in a very different way. So this is basically the scale that we're now working at that became possible, again, because of consumer-grade electronics stacked, high-density wafer stacks, all the things that are being done for your cell phones we've been able to incorporate into these pacemakers. If you look at this thing, and I'm not gonna spend any time on this, the battery is the size of a Tic Tac. It lasts for nine years. It's a stack, stack wafer inside that has oscillators, memory, communication technology, low energy Bluetooth, all that stuff is on this little stack inside and then it has a feed through. And that's the whole size of the pacemaker. And you say, gee, that's pretty interesting. And what's interesting about it is that it doesn't require surgery. This thing's implanted through a catheter. And so it, I could teach most of you in the course of 
10 minutes to do this. You come up through the venous system into the right heart, just launch this thing. It has a little night and all wings. They reach out and, and have an active fixation. And this thing stays in the heart forever. It's a 10 year life. Some of you are asking, what about dual chamber pacing? We can put one of these in the atrium. They communicate with each other, so you can do what you want with this. And this is our next generation pacemaker. It's, it'll be released in the US probably in a year. We're already using this in Europe. It's in clinical trials in the US. We call this the Micra. So the question is, how far can you go with this? And I'm going to sort of show you in a slide or two that you can go a lot further in deep miniaturization than what you just saw. That's pretty easy. Anyone can do that. But our next pacemaker after that, which is in development, is on this silicon wafer. This is a six inch wafer. And there are 60 pacemakers on here. So if you watch carefully, I'm going to just sort of show you this. Uh, we have a foundry out in Tempe where we make these. On this six inch wafer, 60 pacemakers, we place all the electronics. This is just CMOS manufacturing. It's the same thing it's done for Apple. We put the CPU down here. We've got oscillators. We've got memory, radios. It all goes down. This then gets hermetically sealed. We turn it over and we put a thin film battery in the back into this. And when you're done, you have 60 pacemakers here. You just have to cut them out. And when you're done with this thing, it looks a little bit like this. So here's the next generation pacemaker on a penny. This isn't, we're not making this up. We make these, it's, it's doable. Again, it all comes out of the chip industry. We could have never done this if the chip industry hadn't been built. I saw yesterday Intel shipped 100 million CPUs last month. I mean, so if we, without Intel, we couldn't do this, but it's pretty straightforward. And then you kind of use your imagination. This is all the areas today that we pace in the body in so-called neuromodulation. We have a business that we created from our pacing business about 30 years ago in pacing virtually anything in the body. So we, we probably have some physicians here. I know Tom is one. Everything in your body is electrically active. Everything. So whether it's the blink of your eye or the release of a digestive enzyme, the release of a neurotransmitter, the movement of your hand, the contraction of your heart, peristalsis through the gut, bladder function, you name it. And I can reduce that ultimately to an electrical chemical reaction. Everything that goes on in your body can be reduced to an electrical chemical reaction. So it's just a matter of going there and pacing and turning on two leads and start generating electricity. And I assure you, something will happen. Now, Tom, not always good. But our aim is to do something useful. This is particularly appealing in the central nervous system because those of you in the pharmaceutical world here know that God doesn't want drugs in the brain. He created a thing called the blood-brain barrier. It's massively obstructive to large things like proteins. And so we see degenerative neurological disease as probably one of the biggest opportunities of the next 20 years. And I think it almost all is going to be done through some form of neuromodulation. I don't see a lot of opportunity. We're working with Alnylam to knock down the Huntington gene with an interfering RNA. With a pump system infusion, it's really complicated. And so there, you will see biologics in the brain, but it requires some really, really complicated infusion systems. It's much more straightforward to do neuromodulation. I'll show you some examples of this in a minute. But if you look down the list, you can see these are all areas where we have commerce today. The things that are asterisked we're, are in development. We don't have a label for it, uh, so view it as R&D. The epilepsy label, I think, is soon to come out. But all the rest that you see on this thing, we already have a business in. The problem is that we have to implant a pulse generator, one of these good old-fashioned pacemakers. Not the little one, but the, currently a big pace generator. And then we drag leads to the area of interest and plug them in. And if you go back and look at the scale that we're working at, with, um, you, you can start to imagine how this thing can be delivered by catheters. It can probably be shot from guns, laparoscopically applied. And just use your imagination. I'm going to leave it here with this, that there's no end, no end. No end of opportunity for neuromodulation. And we, we of course, know this. We have a, a, a reasonable business. It's about a $1.6 billion business today uh, with pretty profitable. And so the pharmaceutical companies have sort of caught on to this. And it's been a little amusing to me that they've decided not to call it neuromodulation, which is what it is. They now are referring to a new branch of pharmacology, which re they refer to as electroceuticals. And, or bioelectronic medicine. And as far as I can tell, this is neuromodulation. Again, everything in the central and peripheral nervous system is modulated, all physiologic activity, heart, gut, even the inflammatory system in the spleen is modulated by the autonomic nervous system. 
GSK got so interested in this that they set up a new venture fund within GSK called Action Potential Ventures. Uh, and they only invest in what I call neuromodulation, they call electroceuticals. And I just went through and, and listed 10 of my favorite companies that fall beneath this rubric of electroceuticals. And I encourage all of you to sort of pick one or two of these that might sound interesting to you and read about them because I think there's a huge future here. And it's a, it, this is the grist of startups, in my opinion, because you don't, this doesn't require discovery. It requires invention. We already have discovered the function of the central and autonomic nervous systems. It's just a matter of how can you effectively modulate them. And again, that's invention, not discovery. Biotech is really hard, in my opinion, because it requires some bench discovery. Uh, the medical device world, as I think most of you know, has a completely different vector of innovation. Think about this. You want a new molecular entity, or you want a new therapeutic protein, or you want to discover a microRNA, you go to the bench at Emory or Georgia Tech or the University of Georgia or Morehouse Medical School, and you find some smart people at the bench who, one, who work and work and work, and one day they have a discovery. And then they translate this out to the bedside, and there's not a lot of physicians necessary for this process. If you look at all the interesting medical devices, every one of them, without exception, every one of them can be traced to the bedside. I swear it. Physicians struggling, this doesn't work, this is not a good system, and they will articulate the problem, the need, to an engineer. And the engineer will go back to the bench and jerry up some prototype and bring it back to the bedside so you know that dog won't hunt. Go back to the bench and it's back and forth, but it starts at the bedside and goes, the vector goes back to the bench. So instead of this sort of romantic notion of bench to bedside innovation in the device world, it's actually bedside to bench. And this, all these things actually began at the bedside. I know, I know the origins of every single one of these. And I, I just want to pull out a few. I think you know Cyberonics is the only commercial company. It, it does vagal nerve stimulation. Uh, so those of you in the room who don't know about the vagus nerve, go read about it. We have 12 cranial nerves. This is the 10th nerve. Vagus is Latin for wandering. This nerve wanders everywhere. It innervates your eyes, your heart, your gut, venous system, vascular system, spleen. It's everywhere. And so it shouldn't surprise you that if you start stimulating it, that all sorts of things happen. It has afferent fibers that go back to the base of the brain, it has efferent fibers that go everywhere, and so stimulating this causes all sorts of stuff to go on. And there's companies around, Cyberonics has managed to cobble a really interesting business together for vagal nerve stimulation, primarily for epilepsy. Uh, it's an afferent nerves going back to the brain, but you can also do this for depression. Uh, one of the most interesting companies is functional neuromodulation, the second one on this list, this is based out of Toronto. Andres Lozano is a neurosurgeon who does deep brain stimulation, and he's targeting certain areas of the brain, and he's able to, and you can see, go to their website, you'll see functional MNR, that they can wake up dormant circuits within the brain that are responsible for cognitive function. And, and so this may or may not work, but it's an example of electroceuticals. It's functional neuromodulation. Uh, Neuropace is, is soon to be a commercial company, pacing in the brain to overdrive epilepsy and, and ward it off. I really like Novocures. You should go, go read this. It's a really interesting idea. Those of you who are biologists in the room know that most cancer has to rely on mitosis. You need dividing cells. Turns out that the mitotic spindle is assembled through a series of, of, of polar peptides that get together bipolar peptides and, and assemble. And if you shine an electromagnetic field through mitotic cells, you can actually disrupt the spindle. And so you can read more about this. I'm not going to go into this, but these, this is out of, out of Israel where I go a lot. 20% of the interesting stuff I see is in Israel. Good reasons for it. Most of it comes out of the Israeli Defense Forces. It's guidance and surveillance. It works for weapons. It works for devices. But this, this came out of the Technion, and these guys have actually one of the most impressive treatments that I've seen for glioblastoma. Little helmet passing electromagnetic fields, but they're working on all sorts of solid tumors. It's really worth looking at this. It's an interesting idea. Uh, mainstay is a neurorehabilitation thing for they're stimulating the multifidus muscle in the spine, which is like a mainstay for your spine, to basically do neurorehabilitation. This is not for pain, it's really for rehabilitation. Interesting idea. Uh, I'm going to kind of go down. Biocontrol is another Israeli company. We're heavily invested in it. This is they're doing selective vagal nerve stimulation for heart failure. So yeah, I'm not going to go into the details of any of these. I, these are just 10 of 30 companies that I could talk to you about that are in this field of electroceuticals 
which is why GlaxoSmithKline said, you know what, maybe we ought to have a little venture fund around action potentials and figure out how we can get in on this. And a lot of people are trying to get in on this. And the nice thing about this, for those of you in the pharmaceutical world, is that neuromodulation in devices in general don't have side effects. It's rare for you to have untoward events with a device. They're just engineered devices, and you don't, you don't get surprised by them. We tray, of course, untoward events and side effects. We tray for that quality defects, and that's our own little issue. And so when these devices fail, bad things happen. But there's no side effects from these, and so it's an interesting opportunity. Some of you may know that we have a very good business in deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's. It's a standard of care for advanced Parkinson's. Uh, unlike the drugs for advanced Parkinson's, there's no side effects with deep brain stimulation. It either works or it doesn't. So just an idea. I'm going to segue for five or ten minutes. I'm going to stop. I, I, this is another interesting thing that comes out of the consumer-grade electronics industry that immediately plays out in medicine. And by the way, it, it plays out just not just in medical devices. It plays out in every field that any of you are in here, whether you're interested in drugs for neurological diseases, drugs for heart failure, drugs for hypertension, drugs for diabetes. What I'm going to show you now is going to play out in all these fields because medicine's changing. Some of you may have noticed that the world's out of money. And we're spending today 18% of the GDP on healthcare. We can't do that. And so we can't be bringing out products that are going to continue to add to the healthcare system. Everything that we make at Medtronic goes through a pretty careful analysis of how we can take cost out of the system because we don't believe that we'll be paid for our devices if we can't make some economic value argument that not only does this thing work, not only is it kind of interesting and makes patients better, but it actually is going to save the system money. In order to do that, you have to own the outcome of these devices. Most people don't realize the value of our devices at the time of implant. You get a cardiac resynchronization device for heart failure, you're not going to realize the value of that until you leave the hospital and don't come back. You get an aortic valve replacement in the hospital, you don't really realize the value of that until you leave the hospital and you leave, live another 10 years of productive life. And so we have realized that we have to own the outcomes of our, it used to be it was fee for service, you just put it in, you got paid, everybody was happy. Those days are over around the world, not just in the United States. And so everything that we do, and I would encourage everyone in this room is working on a medical product or a drug, or, you have to go through the process of figuring out what is going to be the economic value argument here, or you're not going to get paid. You're just not going to get paid. So we realized early on that we needed to own the outcomes of our devices. And the only way to do that, we're not going to have a core of nurses and doctors wandering around doing house calls. And so we realized that we had to start looking at how we could use communication information technology to stay in touch with not only our devices, but the patients themselves. So we've been working on this for 10 years, but I had a sort of cataclysmic epiphany, if you'll allow this mixed metaphor. Um, about three years ago, I was in Chengdu, China. Has anyone been in Chengdu here? This is the gateway to um, Western China. It's the largest city coming from the West until you get to the Eastern seaboard of China. It's the capital of Sichuan province, and the largest hospital in the world is in, the, is in Chengdu. Today, they have 8,500 beds. I don't, know, I, I don't know what Grady is, but I'd say Grady's probably an 800 to 1,000 bed hospital. I, I really don't know. Some of you may know, but I can assure you there's no hospitals in Georgia that are more than 1,000 beds. This is 8,500 beds, but the good news, Russell, is that they're building 5,000 more beds because this is the lineup at the outpatient clinic at Chengdu Hospital. I took this picture. People come for three days by train to Chengdu from Western China, and they queue up early in the morning, they see four and a half million outpatients a year. And the people wait in line for 10 to 12 hours to see the doctor for one minute. One minute. Now that can't be right. Can that be right? It can't be right. But that's the nature of medicine. So they're trying to build more beds, more clinic capacity. And I'm here to tell everyone in this room that we cannot build enough beds in the world to take care of the people who need to take care of. So, this is a little analysis of the world's population that I put together. I think it's correct. Medtronic sells into a premium market around the world. It's a lot of the United States, Europe, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Korea. And if you add up all those people, it's about a billion and a half people that we serve a market to with our products, which are largely premium products. We work on some value products largely in China. There's another one and a half billion people between China and India and Kazakhstan and Russia and places like that who can afford value products. 
which we don't really sell. I mean, these are not products that Medtronic makes. There's another four billion people on Earth who have no access to healthcare of any kind. Can that be right? It can't be right to me. I'm a physician, and I think our mission is to serve everyone. It's that right. It's not some financial privilege. It's the way it's set up in most places in the world. So the question is, how are we going to get access to four billion people? Well, let me tell you again, we can't build hospitals like the West China Hospital in Chengdu. It's just not going to work. And so we realized a long time ago that we needed to somehow have distributed medicine. And it may be Apple, you know, it may be Samsung, it may be a lot of people, but there's no question that these phones, mobile devices that communicate, are better and better. And then you can start to imagine how you can begin to use handheld devices to manage patients and just suspend judgment for a minute. I know it's the only thing about give me a break. I mean, we're not going to have cell phones as doctors. We are. They're not going to do appendectomies. They won't replace an aortic valve. But a lot of chronic diseases are going to be better managed this way. And just let me sort of show you the setup. So listen on this slide. Someone in this room can probably find their rightful place in this galaxy and shine their star. These are the elements of being able to remotely manage 4 billion people with chronic diseases. Uh, you, 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 it starts with, and here's where I think a lot of the commerce is, in implantable and wearable sensors, and that's good news because that's invention, not discovery. It requires communication, distance telemetry. If you, I have, if Tom had a sensor on and I'd like to sense it with my cell phone, he needs to be able to send that information locally, not through broadband towers, and that's distance telemetry. There's lots of people who work on radios we do, but this is actually kind of hard. Uh, it requires these devices. And everybody that I talk to, I visited Samsung recently. I go to Sony, Panasonic, Apple. They all think it's their deal. I, a lot of people will be able to do this. Qualcomm is all over this. Uh, it requires broadband networks. And here's the good news. We couldn't possibly build the broadband networks to do this. It's too expensive. But guess what? They've already been built. I was at Docomo in Tokyo, the largest broadband carrier for Asia. And they were lamenting that they're losing money on text messaging. That's basically what they use their broadband towers for. They said, it doesn't work. It's a commodity. We can't make money. They want to carry valuable data, valuable data on their broadbands. What would be the most valuable data that you could think of in the back of the room? And so you recognize it's healthcare data. And so they're all over this. Verizon's all over this. I mean, lots of people think it's their deal. Supercomputing, it turns out that if we're streaming data from the one and a half million symptomatic heart failure patients that keep coming back to the hospital in the United States. 35 billion a year spent in the United States on hospitalized patients. It's ridiculous. We can keep most of these people out if you could monitor them. But if we're going to start streaming data from all the heart failure patients, all the patients who have diabetes, all the patients with hypertension, you can start to see this is a lot of data and it requires supercomputing. IBM's all over this. The same people are listening to cell phone conversations. Uh, we don't have operators in the middle of that interface, and we will not have doctors in the middle of the interface of these data. But it does require some fairly careful web architecture. Not us, but again, you start to see the opportunity in the room. Look at this carefully. Somewhere, you can start to see, I can make a business out of that. And you can. And ultimately, the, the, it, it has to be a human interface somewhere along the way. And so you, you need patient call centers. I'm going to just show you one example of this quickly. This is, this is an active implanted leadless pressure sensor that's going to go in the pulmonary circulation. We make this. It's in R&D. Uh, and what we do is basically, again, could teach anyone to do this. is easy. Just come through the venous system and wind your way through the right heart into the pulmonary circulation. Every intern can do this with a Swan-Gans catheter. And you put a wire out into the pulmonary artery, and we just take a catheter out there, and we launch this thing. Again, it's not different than the technology in that little pacemaker, and, but it has a pressure sensor on it. Little nitinol wings spread so it doesn't become an embolus and lodge. And this thing just sits there and tweets pulmonary pressures. So again, use your imagination. Pulmonary, elevated pulmonary pressures are the proximate cause of hospitalization with heart failure. If we can monitor these at a distance, we know that we can keep a large number of these people out of the hospital. Right here in Atlanta, you have an alternative to this. It's called CardioMAMS. It's not an active sensor, but it's a pressure sensor that can be interrogated. Same idea. It's the same scale. Gets launched in pulmonary circulation. I believe Jay Yadoff is going to be speaking to you today, and I, I won't take his thunder. This is a really cool device made here in, in the greater Atlanta area. This is a cool device, and just I could show these all day. I mean, this again, I'm trying, I know we have students here, I'm trying to enthuse you with the opportunity. There's no end. Because remember, this doesn't require discovery, it requires invention. Generally easier, just hard work. So, Google, who would have thought Google would be interested in this? They, of course, think it's their future as well. Why are all these people thinking it's their future? Well, duh. 
18% of the GDP, $3 trillion being spent on healthcare, it's where all the money is. And the opportunity is to take money out. If you can take money out of the system, you make money. Everybody wins, everybody's happy, and so everybody thinks it's their destiny. Google X, healthcare is one of their biggest deals, and I happened to say at the Mass Medic meeting about two months ago that this is potentially our biggest competitor at Medtronic 10 years from now, Google. This was hooted down back at Medtronic, but they're, you know, and I, have, I think partly because I said Google has a lot of money, they have a lot of imagination, and they're not constrained by a 65-year legacy. Well, I happen to wear a 65-year-old company. It was misunder misunderstood locally, Russell. It, but we are constrained by a legacy. We like to do things. We make pacemakers. And so this is a really clever idea. They made the whole thing. It's an 80 by 80 micron chip that has a glucose oxidase chemistry sensor on it. And it's got an RF band around that's powered. It's contact lens. You put it on, and it measures glucose in the blood tears. It communicates locally with Google Glass, of course. But it can also, if you just put your cell phone up here and, and have a phone conversation, it actually communicates to your cell phone. This was just licensed by Alcon, the contact lens maker. They actually want to use some of the Google technology to make an accommodating lens that goes on the surface of the eye. It's interesting. Don't, anyway, these are just two examples of sensors. And again, I've told you this sort of remote management thing requires wearable or implanted sensors, so just use your imagination. This thing goes on and on and on. There's all sorts of things in it. Again, it's, it's discovery, that not, it's invention instead of discovery. So I mentioned this is bigger than Medtronic, and it is. You don't need to see in the back of the room who all these people are. They're all the suspects that you would think, Motorola, Nokia, Samsung, IBM, Apple, Microsoft, Qualcomm, Docomo. They all see themselves in this scheme, and again, I've explained to you why. You can, you can, everyone also sees that they're the value. I was at Cisco Systems. They think that they're going to be in the middle of all internet medical commerce. Well, they, they may be. And so the question is, where is the value in each of these segments? I happen to believe it's in these two green bars. Easy for me to say it's what we do. We make sensors and that are implanted largely for, to communicate with our devices. Today, most of our devices have closed-loop systems that require sensing. But if you can sense heartbeat or blood pressure or temperature, pulmonary pressure, there's no reason that that can't be communicated to an external device. And then this thing goes broadband, and then you start to see the data acquisition opportunities. But if I were in the room thinking, Where, where's my place? This is going to be big. I think it's going to be the biggest thing in medicine in the next 20 years. Because remember, there's 4 billion people out there who have no health care. You're going to build a hospital for them? You're going to train doctors for them? It's impossible. So we have to distribute this, it's, uh, and it will be distributed. And not, not everything, and I haven't showed you this, but I mean, there's really interesting opportunities in diagnosis as well. Uh, look it up, uh, XPRIZE this year is for the tricorder. It's a handheld device that makes 15 diagnoses by spitting or peeing on it. And it, it's, it. It's clearly doable, clearly doable. These are all the diseases that we are currently working on at Medtronic that we think could be effectively managed. These aren't surgical diseases. Again, this is management of chronic diseases, which of course is the healthcare burden. In the United States this is where most of the money is being spent. And the ones that are asterisks, we have active programs. We're trying to figure out how to write the algorithms, how to get the appropriate sensing devices. Uh, but, but they're big, they're really big. I'm gonna end with this slide because I know that there's probably people in the audience who are saying, the guy's nuts. You can't manage people with cell phones. We're not prepared to do that as, as, as people, and maybe you and your parents and people my age aren't. My kids are. And you know, if people are prepared to accept a car without a driver, which is clearly going to happen by our same friends at Google, uh, if they're going to accept this, I don't think there's any issue about them accepting that a lot of their health care is going to be delivered. Imagine you had a child with type 1 diabetes, and you want to send them to Lookout Mountain summer camp, and they're brittle, and you're not going to send them because there's not a nurse there who would promise to take care of them the way that Susan would. And if I said to you, Tom, we'll keep an eye on Patton. We'll, we'll watch her in the cloud. Not only will we follow her blood sugar, we'll turn her pump off if her blood sugar is too low, We'll accelerate it if it's too high. And not only that, we're going we're to push out messages to her saying, what the hell are you doing? Why would you do that? And so, again, some people may not be comfortable, but would you pay for that if you were a parent? 
you would, but we think we can do this for a lot of things like heart failure. And so it's a big opportunity. And again, I just wanted, I know this is sort of a bio meeting, but Russell, I wanted to sort of show you that these things all come together and a lot of the concepts I've talked about here play out in pharmaceuticals. So I, I thank you for the opportunity to be here. I am, again, for the students here. This is very cool stuff and, you know, get involved in it and you're at phenomenal institutions to do it and stay busy, get busy, figure out a way to come convert your ideas into commerce because if people don't get access to this, you know, Nobel Prize is good for you, but it's not good for anyone else if it doesn't get applied. So God bless all of you. Good luck. Thank you very much. Yeah.